Okay, let's go, guys. Yeah. Imagine for a second that you are three years old. You're driving along, eating your ice cream. You're on the way home from the pool. And bam! You hear a loud bang. You're jerked around in your car seat. Your parents and siblings, they're screaming. You have no idea what happened, but now you are screaming too. You can't move from your car seat because you're buckled in. And then there's strangers that are breaking into your car, pulling you out, and they strap you to a board. They put this big plastic necklace around your neck, and now you can't even see your mom or your dad. You're still strapped to the board, and you're put into a big van. Then there are bright lights, a big building. Everyone's touching you, cutting off your clothes and asking you questions that you can't understand. All you want to do is move. You want to get up, get away, get back to your family. But you can't because you're strapped to this dang board. And this plastic thing around your neck feels like it's tight and getting tighter. Would someone just get the plastic necklace off already? Welcome to EM Pulse, bringing research and expert opinion to the bedside. We're your hosts, Julia Magana and Sarah Medeiros. Welcome back to EM Pulse. Okay, I've never had to wear a C-collar, but I have watched enough children buck and pull at the C-collar to know it is not a comfortable or even effective process. Then we get CTs and x-rays to look for that rare but can't miss cervical spine injury. Guys, we need to be more intentional about how we do this, especially with our kids. Fortunately, we have PCARN on the task. Remember, PCARN is a federally funded research network that answers questions about acutely ill and injured children in a really intentional way. I am here with Dr. Julie Leonard, who is a professor of pediatrics at Nationwide Children's Hospital and the Ohio State University College of Medicine. She specializes in pediatric emergency medicine and practices in the emergency department at Nationwide Children's Hospital. She's also the senior author of this hot off the press publication, PCARN Prediction Rule for Cervical Spine Imaging of Children Presenting to the Emergency Department with Blunt Trauma, a Multi-Center Prospective Observational Study. Whew, that's a mouthful, but it basically sums up the article. And we are excited to bring you this rule early so you too can be an early adopter. Welcome, Julie. Thanks for having me. This C-spine project is your brainchild, and the development of this has been a major focus of your career. Tell me, why have you dedicated so much of your career to studying pediatric C-spine injury identification? Wow, you are correct. (laughs) It has been a lifelong endeavor. Um, You know, I've been sort of working with PCARN and pecking away at developing this clinical prediction rule for 20 years. Wow. So a couple of things sort of sparked my interest. The first was a a patient that I had as a medical student who was a a teenager who unfortunately did have a spinal cord injury uh, after a motor vehicle crash and very articulate young lady. And she described her trauma experience to me. And of course, she is that can't miss patient and, you know, the one that we're worried about. And then I, you know, juxtaposed that against all of the patients that I was seeing in the emergency department that were coming in and languishing in our waiting rooms, languishing in our patient care spaces, waiting to get cleared of potential cervical spine injury. So at that time, they would be laying on a hard, rigid surface on a long board with a cervical collar in place and we really weren't very efficient at deciding who was injured and who was not injured. And just by default, because we didn't want to miss that patient that has a a devastating injury, we would just knee-jerk order x-rays or CT scans. And ultimately, just in my mind, realizing it was an inefficient process. We really need to do this well, right? We need to approach this so that we're 
evaluating patients from multiple centers across the United States, different settings, and get thousands of patients to find those very rare can't-miss injuries. Let's start by kind of talking about how you did this through PCARN. How did you prospectively derive and then validate this clinical prediction role in broad strokes? You know, 20 years ago, some really great scientists were working on developing adult clinical prediction rules. So the Nexus criteria and the Canadian C-spine rule. And they sort of set the trend for this idea that we needed to be spending our time developing these clinical prediction rules to help us improve our care of injured patients. Unfortunately, those endeavors did not include children. So we really didn't have a baseline. We didn't have any retrospective information about which risk factors we should be worried about. Um, Certainly nothing that was done in sort of a large fashion looking prospectively. So we just very systematically in PCARN sort of laid the groundwork for this now ultimate large study we completed where first we looked retrospectively at large population of patients and tried to identify what kinds of factors could be used in clinical prediction. And then we sort of tested those factors, looking at patients moving forward in time to see, yes, you know, can we use them? Are they, you know, good variables or predictors? And then as a third step, once we said, okay, yes, this is the information we should be collecting um, and the patient population that we should be enrolling and studying to develop the clinical prediction rule, we launched in this network-wide endeavor to develop a clinical prediction rule for cervical spine injuries. And the network-wide clinical prediction rule, that was done at how many sites and kind of walk us through how we did this. So PCARN is um, made up of 18 different emergency departments throughout the United States that collaborate together to perform uh, research. And for this study, every single one of um, the 18 sites was involved in the, the study. And what we did is basically children that came in and they were being evaluated after blunt trauma we approached their care team and asked them to fill out an electronic survey or form just to give us their observations about that patient. Each site participated on average about two years, and we enrolled 22,000 children. And information that was very focused on what we had previously identified as probably the right set of risk factors to be studying. And then ultimately um, took a look at a month out after each of those children presented to the emergency department. We would look in their medical record at all of the imaging and testing that was done to see which children were ultimately diagnosed with a cervical spine injury. And if they didn't have any x-rays obtained, we would call their families just to be extra safe and to make sure that we weren't missing any children that ultimately got diagnosed with a cervical spine injury somewhere else. And so then ultimately, we were able to compare a group of children, 433 children that had cervical spine injuries, to all of the other children that did not, and determine which of these risk factors was able to best identify that group of children with cervical spine injury. I love how systematic that was. And, you know, with the other clinical prediction rules with inside of PCARN, we have focused a lot on clinically important traumatic brain injury, clinically important intra-abdominal injury. Tell me, what kind of injuries are we looking at with C-spine, Julie? Is is that a fair classification or what kind of C-spine injuries? So we elected a, a very broad definition for cervical spine injury. And we did that very purposefully. So it was pretty much any injury of the cervical spine. And the reason that we did that is that unlike head injury, where you have three or four main types of injury that occur around the brain, with cervical spine injury, 
you have a very broad group of injuries. And the problem is, is that once you see one injury, there's a, a risk that other injuries in the cervical spine are there. And so you have to sort of dig deeper until you can really say that this particular injury is is stable and it doesn't need an intervention. So it's a different animal, for lack yeah, of a better yeah. term, than head injuries and, and abdominal trauma. Our definition is any cervical spine injury, including ligamentous injuries, fractures, cord injuries, or vascular injuries, so injuries to the blood supply of the spinal cord. So you mentioned that there were 433 injuries identified, and that's out of 22,430 patients that were enrolled? Correct. Yep. So about 2% of the total population had confirmed cervical spine injury. Is that right? Correct. Yeah, that actually rings true to my own clinical practice. So it's interesting that that is how that fell out. What were the risk factors for cervical spine injury? Yeah, this is also a way that the clinical prediction rule for cervical spine injury is different than the head injury rule. Basically, there's one test for head injury. You get a CT scan. But For cervical spine injury, you can get a CT scan, but we also know that just plain x-rays are 90% or greater sensitivity for any kind of spine injury. Instead of a CT or not, we have sort of layers of what we could potentially use for screening, with the most invasive screening being a CT scan and then, you know, the plain x-rays. So, Ultimately, we identified a group of four risk factors that we deemed to be high risk. And if you had one of those factors, your risk of cervical spine injury exceeded 10%. So in that population that had one of the four risk factors, one in 10 of the children actually had a cervical spine injury. And those risk factors to us as traumatists, like when we're in the trauma bay, it wouldn't surprise you. The, no. These are the kinds of findings that you're like, yes, this is a, you know, a very severely injured child. These risk factors are if their GCS is three to eight, if their AVPU score is unconscious, so the patient's unconscious, if they have any abnormality or in the airway, breathing, or circulation, or they have a focal neurologic deficit on exam. Those four risk factors, as I mentioned, one out of 10 children, if they had one of those risk factors, actually had a cervical spine injury. So if you look at cost-benefit analysis, like, you know, who should you be CT scanning? It's really that category of patients where the risk of the CT scan and the ionizing radiation is outweighed by the risk that they have a cervical spine injury. And so that's the group that it would be very reasonable to actually screen them for cervical spine injury. So then the next step in the rule is if you eliminate those children that have one of those findings and then you re-examine that population, then there's a set of five risk factors that places a child at non-negligible risk. So their risk, if if the risk for cervical spine injury ranges between one and two percent, this the risk in the group of patients that have these next five factors is somewhere double that. You know, so not ten percent, but they 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 still have an increased risk for having a cervical spine injury, and so those risk factors are. Any altered mental status, so the patients that have a GCS of 9 to 14 or on the AVPU scale, they're either responsive to pain um, or responsive to verbal stimuli only. Those that have other signs of altered mental status, so sort of that, that patient that's just not quite acting right. And then if they have any sort of neck complaints, so they're, the child is telling you that their neck hurts, or they have posterior midline neck tenderness on examination, 
And then ultimately, if they don't have neck findings and they don't have any sort of altered mental status, then do they have substantial injuries to the torso? So the torso being from the clavicles to the pelvis or substantial um, injuries to the head. And in our study, the way that we described or defined substantial injuries, basically it's injuries that would lead you to do something for the patient. So it would lead you to admit the patient, would lead, you know, to an intervention, a surgical intervention. So these weren't, you know, cuts or scrapes or, you know, surface bruises. They were, you know, really substantial injury to the torso. And so if you had any of those risk factors, then our recommendation with that particular population warrants screening of the cervical spine, and it would be most appropriate to screen them with x-ray based on um, the level of risk that they have for cervical spine injury. And so then ultimately, if you don't have any of those nine risk factors, then your risk for cervical spine injury approaches, you know, zero percent. And it's definitely, you know, at a negligible level. Um, so approaching zero. And it, that's the patient population that it's reasonable to clinically clear them of injury without getting any kind of imaging study. I love the practicality of those types of questions that we're asking and the risk factors that we're looking for. I noticed that there's no high risk mechanism such as diving or ejection from an MVC. Can you speak to why those aren't in those uh, variables that we're looking at? So obviously, um, those mechanisms should like heighten your awareness, and you you should be very thoroughly examining those patients and you know, evaluating them for whether or not they have any of these clinical signs and symptoms. But when you are able to evaluate a large population of children and you're able to get the exam findings directly from the bedside clinician, that's when we're able to create a decision rule that's really based on the physical exam and the signs and symptoms of, of the patient. Because, you know, that is going to be much more specific to the injury as opposed to, yeah, they had a mechanism that was, you know, placed them at higher risk from, to be truthful, any type of injury, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, and so then they, they should be seen by a physician and evaluated and cared for. But then when the physician's at bedside, they can rely upon their clinical skill set there and examine the patient and determine, you know, whether or not they have any findings. So those mechanisms bring you into the tool, like consider using it, but now we get to actually apply it to the patient that's in front of us, engage our brain, engage our skills here. Absolutely. I, I really like that. Um, that makes it much more patient-centric instead of just mechanism-centric. What about mobility? I noticed that range of motion was not on that list, and I know that in the past that's been proposed. Tell me, how did that fall out of the risk factors here? In some pilot work that we looked at, and indeed also in this, this larger endeavor, what we found is that when patients come to the hospital and they're placed in a cervical collar, there is a reluctance on the part of the physician to actually open up that collar and to ask them to move their neck around. The physicians will really only undertake that particular maneuver if they feel really confident about you know, their, their exam and the patient's condition, or they've already done the screening um, tests, and then they decide that now they're going to open up the collar and, and actually check the range of motion. So in that retrospective study, right, we sort of, when somebody documents their physical exam, yeah, they've cleared the collar and they've ranged the neck, you know, and we have some information about range of motion of the neck. But in reality, when the patient's in front of you and they're in a, a collar, it was more likely that the physician would leave the collar on. And then that's where those complaints of their neck hurting actually become one of the more dominant risk factors. You know, a child actually saying, you know, my, my neck hurts, you know, coming into the model. Julie, how precise is this clinical prediction rule? <laughs> 
you know, we were very pleased that the sensitivity in our validation cohort exceeded 94%. And, you know, most importantly, that sort of 6% of patients where the ED provider did not chart one of our risk factors. When we went back and we looked in the chart or we used other clinicians' observations. So we also asked surgeons to fill out forms for us and pre-hospital providers to fill out forms for us. So if the ED provider in that 6% hadn't charted it, we actually, in most of those patients, actually found one of our risk factors either in the medical record or on one of our other clinicians' forms. So, you know, the the sensitivity is, is really pushing close to 100%. And importantly, the negative predictive value is near perfect. If it's negative, it's really likely to be negative, you know, and that's the way to think about the the negative predictive value. Yeah, it was 99.9%. Really impressive. Who did the tool misclassify, Julie? It was a variety of ages. So there wasn't like a sort of a systematic, you know, miss in there. It was a variety of ages, a variety of mechanisms. I would say importantly, none of the children actually required an intervention. So the injuries that were being missed weren't catastrophic injuries where they needed to have surgery or they needed sort of prolonged uh, use of a cervical brace or or a halo. These were injuries that either were sent home without even a cervical collar or were sent home with a cervical collar, but for a short period of time. So a lot of the injuries were cervical strains um, and sprains of the ligaments of the, the neck. Interesting. Julie, does location matter when it comes to the application of this clinical prediction rule? For example, does it matter if the child is at Nationwide Children's or at a critical access hospital? The good news about the clinical prediction rule is that these are exam findings that we're all taught to look for in our structured trauma evaluation. This is the kind of clinical prediction rule that could be easily applied in the general emergency department. One of the things that we did in our study was to make sure to evaluate children who presented directly to us, meaning that they weren't transfers to us or that we might have some, you know, belief about their injury pattern when we were evaluating them. We looked at just breaking it down with age to see if, you know, it performed poorly in that young age range. And just universally, when we conducted these sensitivity analysis, the the test characteristics were the same. You know, when we tried to, to slice it into some categories that, you know, people might be worried about. And then another aspect of of the study is that we, and this will be just a teaser because this, you know, manuscript's on the horizon. Okay. But we looked at whether or not our pre-hospital providers would make the same observations Mm. and, um, and had very favorable results there as well. So we very much feel like it's a universal clinical prediction rule in the care of injured children as they're coming in to the ED for evaluation. So we might have to have a part two to this podcast is what you're saying. Might have to have a part two. Okay. Sounds good. (laughs) When when you observe 22,000 children, (laughs) there might be a three, a four. (laughs) There could be like 22 parts to this. Got it. Heard. Julie, how do you anticipate that this will change imaging practices? As I mentioned, we were pretty deliberate about creating a tiered clinical prediction rule. Um, Some of the prediction rules, and I'll pick on Nexus, the Nexus criteria. Nexus criteria are image or not. It doesn't really scale it. It doesn't say, you know, get a CT scan, get plain x-rays. And we were very deliberate about, we wanted to not only say, you know, like, which kids should you screen? We wanted to also give some guidance about 
okay, when is it appropriate to use the CT scan? When is it appropriate to just go straight to the CT scan? And so we created that tiered model. And what was great about it is by tiering it like that and taking that approach, basically, if we triage our children that are at the highest risk to CT scan, and then we triage that non-negligible category to plain x-rays, and you take a look and we sort of apply that sort of logic to this population of 22,000 children. If if they had followed that guidance in their imaging, it would have cut CT rates in half, approaching 17% to half that or less. And the nice part is it would also decrease slightly the x-ray use. So by sort of adopting this tiered model, what we expect is that we will ultimately cut our CT rates in half and that we won't in turn be seeing an increase in x-ray use. So globally, imaging rates will go down. How do you anticipate this rule interacts with MRIs or does it at all? The role of MRI in screening children for cervical spine injuries is controversial. Yes, to say the it least. is, yeah. for sure. And, you know, there's sort of multiple schools of thought because, you know, there are benefits to MRI, obviously no, you know, no radiation. And there are some injuries that you can detect better with MRI. But there are some injuries that you detect, you know, better with CT scan and access to MRI in resource-limited areas can be difficult. And for children and critically ill patients, when you need to screen them, the length of time of getting an MRI um, for the critically ill and actually being in an MRI scanner with a, a critically ill patient is hazardous and, and can have hazards. And then also with a young child where you might have to sedate them for the MRI. So as as a first pass screening in the emergency department, it would be hard to sort of generally deploy that. But that's not to say that MRI doesn't have a role in evaluating children for potential cervical spine injuries. And also, that's not to say that any of these tests for a high-risk patient um, that you you actually are stopping just with one test, right? So a lot of these patients, in order to adequately evaluate their injuries, even once their injury is identified, need to have an additional test. So what we're recommending is, you know, what is the most practical first screening test to get? But if you have a patient and your index of suspicion is very high for injury, Definitely, this algorithm isn't saying to you, do just this test and you're done. You know, the, that high-risk, you know, patient, there is likely going to be a subpopulation that needs to go on and have MRI. Julie, how has this informed your own clinical practice? In the trauma bay, in my own clinical practice, when I get to those pauses in my uh, trauma survey, I actually call out the decision rules and I use all of them. And I say, okay, this you know patient doesn't have X, Y, and Z, so we don't need a CT scan, you know, of the head. They don't, you know, so I, I will pause in my practice, you know, right in that ATLS mindset. And when you're sort of regrouping and talking about what testing, then I just pull out the, you know, decision algorithms and I walk through it and do it every single time very deliberately. What I find, um, because, in, you know, trauma response, particularly when, you know, it's a trauma activation and you have a big team of, of individuals there that are sort of group decision making, that it's important to have a shared mental model. So, you know, just pulling it right out right there and walking through the algorithm with your team um, helps people come to agreement on what the next, you know, step is for the patient. 
Julie, has there been anything that has surprised you in this process or after all of the, the computer spit out the rule here? Was there anything that surprised you? So our retrospective study and our, our retrospective model for predicting cervical spine injury does look different than this prospective model. And it had different test characteristics. And that surprised me because we were so disciplined in how we sort of defined our chart abstraction for the retrospective variables. So I was a little surprised when we actually asked people for their physical exam findings in the moment that ultimately some of the variables that we found retrospectively sort of fell out, right? Those mechanisms of injury, the you know, predisposing conditions also fell out as a, a risk factor, right? And um, and so I, I think that speaks to that methodology, you know, that you still have to do this sort of laborious task of making sure that you validate something, you know, prospectively with the clinician at the bedside telling you in the moment what they're observing. Um, and I think that that was the, you know, the surprise. I think everybody's hoping that, using machine learning on charts is going to sort of make this process go a little faster. And it might, but my hunch is we're never going to get out of this step of these sort of large prospective endeavors where we actually get the physician's observations in the moment. More surveys ahead for me. Is that what you're saying? That's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> well, fortunately, PCARN is on top of it. Uh, we'll keep asking these questions. You guys keep answering it and uh, we'll keep talking about it. And I think that's a good place to stop. So thank you, Julie, so much for your time and for your work and uh, for asking and answering these questions. Uh, Julia, thanks for having me. I'm excited to, to finally be at this point. Pulse check. PCARN has created another really precise clinical prediction rule that we can use to identify acutely injured children. This time it's cervical spine injury. So we want to get a next CT for children with the following high risk categories GCS 3 to 8, unresponsive on the AVPU scale, abnormal ABCs, or focal neurological deficits. I don't know about you, but that seems fairly intuitive to me. Get flame films if there is altered mental status, self-reported neck pain or neck tenderness to palpation, or substantial head or torso injury. This podcast is part of a soon-to-be-published pediatric trauma toolkit for emergency departments that the Emergency Medical Services for Children Innovation and Improvement Center, or EIAC, has created. The EIAC has several toolkits that I personally use on my shifts and in teaching, so check out the toolkits in the show notes. If you've learned something today, pay it forward and share this podcast with a colleague and follow us on X at Impulse Podcast. Thank you to our department for being a part of this study and answering questions that matter like this. And thank you to OM Productions for always driving safely so I don't have to experience a sea collar. Until next time, stay curious, stay inspired, and stay tuned. Stay tuned.